Hi, everyone. Back with Mind Rolling. And I've got uh, Mark Epstein, Dr. Mark Epstein, back for another chat. Hi, Mark. <laughs> hey there. Another time with me. Yeah. No, and I uh, actually, it came to me that... Uh, because I've been working on something, and the listeners know this because I repeat it with uh, many different people that I'm talking to around uh, a project just about investigating the absolute uh, gluing that we have with our stories of who we think we are. And, the, and of course under all of that is the habitual tendencies, neurotic instinct, all of it, uh, that makes up the big me. It's what Krishnadas calls in many of his, uh, he talks about in many of his talks, the movie of me, and how we get out and start our day, and we're the, uh, you know, we're the protagonist, and we're also the director and the producer, and so on. So, so we've been investigating that in the, in the course of it. There was one great thing, actually, from Alam. I'm not sure if it's Tulku Urgian or one of his sons. That's quite a family out there, right? Yep. Uh, uh, saying, getting rid of habitual tendencies is like taking a rolled-up piece of paper and spreading it out, flattening it, but as soon as you let go, it completely goes back to its original rolled shape. So it's a, so we're talking about this stuff, and yet it is uh, extraordinarily difficult. Uh, it, it, well, first we got to realize what we're doing to ourselves and then trying to extricate from that. So that was, I thought, gee, maybe Mark can help us <laughs> extricate from yeah. that. Yeah, okay. okay. Come on. <laughs> I'll help you with that. Yeah. And uh, so one other uh, interesting thing, I just was with Ram Dass a couple of weeks ago in oh, Maui. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he, uh, right by his uh, his easy chair there, he had going to pieces without falling apart. I went, oh, that's, that's funny. I'm, I'm going to be talking to Mark. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, yeah, well, take a look. I said, okay, I'm yeah. going to grab it. So I grabbed it. And, of course, in it is many, many things that are in reference to just what we're talking about, of course. And uh, so, yeah, can you just maybe f the big overview of yeah. the uh, fact the that rolled we... Up, the rolled up piece of paper yeah. upon yeah. which our lives are written, yeah, exactly. uh, our individuality. Um, well, one, th one thing I've noticed hanging around with Ram Dass and people who have been touched by him and by Neem Karoli Baba and so on, is there can be a tendency to overly diminish uh, the um, importance of, or in the Tibetan Buddhist way of talking, the preciousness of one's own individual incarnation. Uh, one's own individual personality, even with its habitual tendencies and desires and hatreds and shame and whatnot, that um, in the effort to be one with everything and to achieve our, you know, soul and heart uh, truth, uh, there can be a subtle or not so subtle tendency to kind of put down uh, our own uh, our own personalities. I think sometimes people call that spiritual bypass, but um, as a psychotherapist, I'm pretty familiar with it, not just in uh, spiritual people, but I think it's a kind of universal tendency, actually, the other side of narcissism, you know, not to inflate the self, but to diminish it. Mm. So, you know, the, the preciousness of the human birth and uh, how many lifetimes we have struggled to achieve this particular body and this particular mind and these uh, difficult parents and uh, this life, you know, is not something to be taken lightly. Um, and rather it's something to, I think, try to come to a place of respecting and honoring the same way we might have an easier time doing it for another person who we love or for our own soul, with, you know, to which we might not, uh, identi with which we might not identify to the same degree that we do with our so-called selves. So 
you know, I would just put that out there as a kind of corrective uh, and to help people who uh, are edging towards that place of self uh, criticism, because that's big in a lot of people. Mm. Yeah. And I like what you said about how we don't respect our personality. Yeah. Yeah. Talk more about that. That, that, that hits home. Um, well, you know, the more conscious you become and the, the, the sort of um, uh, more humble uh, uh, you become around, you know, the baggage that you're carrying around about yourself, mm. um, you, there's this real uh, desire to kind of put the whole thing down. You know, that story of the enlightened Zen, uh, the, the, uh, the Zen monk who's trudging up to the mountains to look for enlightenment. And on his way, he sees this old guy coming down from the top of the mountain with a sack on his back. And he, he has the sense that this old guy might have achieved the enlightenment that he's going up the mountain to seek. And he stops him and asks him, and the guy says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or actually, he says nothing. He just, the, the, uh, the monk says, you know, do you know anything of this enlightenment? And the old guy just takes the sack off his back and drops it down. And uh, the, the uh, younger monk has a sense of, oh, yeah, I could just put this whole thing down. And then he says, so then, so what then, what then? And the guy picks the sack up and puts it back on his back and keeps on walking <laughs> down, you know? Yeah. So uh, we can only be who we are. And who we are in that tantric way of, uh, you, you know, the demons of ego being transformed into the vehicles of enlightenment who we are have the, must have the seeds of what our enlightened uh, tendencies might be. So um, I like this phrase about becoming one with the capacities that constitute us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so in a sense of uh, embodying the wholeness of who we are already. Mm -hmm. Great, really great. So the, you also talk about uh, in this book, which I found interesting, we talk about emptiness, but yeah. there's the Western e emptiness that we understand, which is more of a void, and the Eastern or Buddhist emptiness, which is bliss, as Bob which likes is, to say. Which is, right, yeah. orgasm, orgasmic uh, bliss. Yeah, yes. exactly. They were too embarrassed to call it orgasm, so they had to call it bliss, Yeah, right. according okay. to Bob. Yeah. Um, but talk about the, uh, the one that we are all very familiar with, that is... Uh, emptiness that seems not to be able to be filled and and how that really affects us uh, in in very profound ways well the western emptiness i was always really interested in the western emptiness uh from my own personal experience uh because i felt it uh, and then when i started training as a psychiatrist with this was in the um mid 80s early to mid 80s i i trained at a uh, psychiatric hospital in Westchester, that was um, sort of in the forefront of treating what was then being called borderline personality disorder, um, which which was a, um, it's a little bit out of fashion now, but people still talk about it, where the people who are subject to it um, have a very intense form of psychological emptiness, such mm. that they're, they're really, um, they really feel empty. <laughs> And they tend to starve themselves with anorexia, or cut themselves, or um, uh, do very, you know, almost suicidal, but not quite, because of the yearning and the emptiness uh, that underlies it. And um, uh, I began to be therapist to a lot of these people and to study with uh, a lot of the psychiatrists who were the best in the field. And I remember coming to Gelek Rinpoche mm. uh, during this time and uh, uh, asking Gelek, you know, what do you make of this emptiness, you, you know, the psychological emptiness versus the Tibetan Buddhist uh, blissful emptiness? Are they the same or are they different, you know? Or is one a prelude to the other, you know, help, help me? And he started going like this, like he said, what is, what is this that a blacksmith does? You know, they, they hit something against, and someone, it was a group uh, kind of discussion, someone said against an anvil, right? He said, yes, 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 against an anvil. He said, this psychological emptiness that you're talking about is like people hitting against uh, real emptiness 
with the with the uh, hitting against it like an anvil. It's like sparks of emptiness where uh, people are not totally understanding. They're identifying too quickly with the feeling instead of really understanding that uh, they don't have to have the uh, uh, the cohesive together a strong sense of self that they're looking for and feeling deprived of. So he said, these are actually minds hitting against emptiness, but it's too great a concept for them to be able to hold it properly. That's wild. Uh, that, I know, uh, isn't that good? Yeah. Um, so I don't even know if he knew what I was talking about with the <laughs> psychological emptiness, you know, because yeah. there's that, uh, you probably know that story of the Dalai Lama in his first meetings with Western psychotherapists, they were all talking about low self-esteem and psychological emptiness. Mm -hmm. And the Dalai Lama was like puzzled, like, what is this you're talking about? You know, how all of you people, like, and he went around the room, do you have this? Do you have this? And they all nodded their heads, yes, of course. He said he, he couldn't understand, like, low self-esteem and people of such uh, high achievement. It wasn't a Tibetan concept, you know? It's unbelievable. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a relationship. There is a relationship because those of us growing up in Western culture where ego development, you know, is the pinnacle, thought to be the pinnacle of achievement, when we don't feel that we have as cohesive, coherent, identifiable, uh, strong sense of self as that person over there, we tend to feel diminished or ashamed. Uh, and wish to, you know, get it maybe but through a relationship or something. Um, but that sense of being, you know, of yearning that in the bhakti tradition, you know, gets directed to God, uh, you, you know, in our culture, it sort of has nowhere to go except to eat, uh, you know, turn back on the self and kind of uh, uh, take it out on ourselves. So there's something to be said for just making room for a little bit of... Uh, emptiness and realizing that that might be the a doorway or an opening or a spark of something greater. I couldn't do that when I was listening to Bob Dylan. That saved me. Maybe that was a little bit of a window yeah, to accept. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh -huh. uh, uh, emptiness appears first as the dark side of our attempts to create a separate and self-sufficient self. That's a, that's a great line. Yeah. Did I say that? You did. I said that. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, and it was around the Gaelic Rinpoche thing. Yeah. Um, and and you, here's what I think is really important for everybody for to to really connect with. Only when we stop fighting with our personal emptiness can we begin to appreciate the transformation that's possible. Yeah. And boredom is involved in all of that as well. Aside from being strangulated by the culture, the parents, and the school, and all of that. Uh, there's a way in which we can't just be. And of course, today, that's even more um, obvious with all of the devices and so on. Uh, well, I, I tried to develop that theme a little more, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years later in this book that I wrote about trauma, where I think like the opening chapter I, I called uh, uh, The Way Out is Through which is something that Joseph Goldstein always says, you know, when you're faced with some kind of personal discomfort, anxiety, or it applies to emptiness also, that the, um, <clears throat> the first tendency is to try to ignore it or get away from it or suppress it or push it to one side. But um, that doesn't work that well. And it's when we get more comfortable with whatever the feelings are, even the most difficult ones like emptiness, or it applies to anger, uh, and so on also. When we learn how to hold those feelings in the space of our minds, which I think is a lot of what meditation is teaching us to do, then those feelings themselves become the doorway through which we go, as trauma, as trauma can also. It becomes the doorway uh, through which the heart actually starts to open. Because mm. not, we're not the only ones having those kinds of feelings, you know, actually. Uh, most of the other people in the room on a meditation retreat are struggling with the same feelings. Yeah, you know? yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I don't know, I can't remember if I told you last time we talked that we've been working on a, uh, a Ram Dass documentary, actually, for, for oh, the really? last yeah, three or four years, four years. Uh, really? And it's a, fine, film, a, a film thing? Yep, a film really? documentary. It's the arc of his life and his teachings. You know, we have all this wonderful uh, 
footage from the uh, media library and yeah, you because know, he was well documented. I mean, incredible. Mm-hmm. We have terabytes and terabytes of the really. Of, oh yeah, no, it's amazing. <laughs> not just audio, but not video just audio. Also? Way more audio, but not just yeah. audio. So That's of course, great. yeah, and we had. Uh, so it's a it's a we're I'm we're in the middle of just getting it uh, fixed to, as to when it'll be released and all that stuff, but uh, becoming nobody yeah. is the name of the film. Great. And and just two or three weeks ago, I did a podcast. I do a podcast with Ram Das here and now, oh, just uh-huh. picking out stuff that I like or that the media library creator has given me. And uh, so there was one thing he did on practice. It was a fabulous talk. I don't know, early 90s or something. And in it he said, only nobody gets free. Yeah. It's like beautiful. Yeah. It's another be here now-ish kind of thing, yeah. right? Only yeah. nobody. And I didn't even know about this. And when the movie was named, I mean, it was so absolutely perfect. But... uh in the in the, uh, something else you said you have to be somebody before you can be nobody yeah and Ram- i didn't say that jack angler said that i quoted it oh really I, I may not have given attribution where you're seeing it but um uh, uh jack angler in the late 70s said that you know you have to be somebody before you can be nobody yeah well and ram Dass I- has talked about it a lot too in, yeah in the day. yeah he walked it back a little bit we, everyone walked it back ram Dass walked it back and yeah. jack walked it back yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you, you know, nobody and somebody, you know, they're they're interrelated. Yeah. Uh, um, and the idea that you can ever be fully somebody, you know, is probably illusion. But on the other hand, there's, you know, so much of the uh, thought that comes from different spiritual traditions that are filtered through, especially Westerners, because we are so uh, oriented to success on any level and whatever it is we're dealing with. So you have to erase yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Et cetera. And what we were talking about, what I said before about honoring our personalities, that's not something we do very well. Right. Well, it's another thing. It's another thing. When the reason Ram Dass had that uh, copy of uh, going to pieces by his bedside is because I was there visiting last year and I brought it for him. Oh. Um, so I'm glad it's still on by, it was still by his bedside. But in, in that visit, uh, at one point we were riding in the car together and um, whoever was driving was playing a tape of Ramdas giving a talk in the 70s uh-huh. where he was just like, you know, like material that I'm sure you have for the documentary where he was deliciously spinning out like one great story after another and then zeroing in and making like a fantastic spiritual point. And I said to him, like, how did you learn how to do that? Like, were, were you just improvising or had you written that all out beforehand? Cause it was so perfectly constructed. Mm. And uh, he turned to me uh, like with a, with a hint of pride. He said, well, my father used to fundraise for Jewish charities. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so he learned at his father's knee. Yeah. So that's a good example of him, you know, somebody Ramdas using his uh, his incarnation yeah. you know, for yeah. a higher purpose. Yeah. Because yeah. who else could have done that, you know? Yeah. No, absolutely. And not and you know, basically, especially nowadays, not being attached to it the way that he you know that he, he maybe he once was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a terrific story in in this book i wish you would tell it which is like you went to naropa in 74 that was a fabulous couple of weeks i wasn't there for whatever reason i was not there and uh but we have all of that on video Uh really Uh, yeah Uh yeah you can see jack and joseph with hair okay (laughs) that's unbelievable um and they were fabulous so you talk about that a little bit but then you also talk about a very, very um, profound experience with Ramdas. You want to tell that story? Yeah, because sure. it's a great story for people, especially who love Ramdas. Well, I, you know, you have to understand. I was only twenty years old uh, in the summer of nineteen seventy-four, turning twenty-one, uh, and I knew hardly anything about anything. Uh, but I was there. Danny Goldman had been a um, he was a graduate student uh, at the university when where I was an undergraduate, and he 
kind of ushered me out there. Mm. So I, I went out there and, you know, uh, Joseph Goldstein was teaching. Uh, he was like the, te- the meditation teaching fellow in Ram Dass's big course. So I met him, became a student of his. Jack Cornfield was teaching uh, meditation. They were just back from uh, Asia, each of them. They didn't know each other then. Uh, and Ram Dass was teaching these big evening classes uh, that you have the uh, videos of, I guess. Hmm. So, and it, for me, it was it was like going to Woodstock, but it was you know uh, <laughs> five years yeah. later. But it was yeah. the the tail end of the '60s. Um, so it was doorway after doorway opening for me. It was really amazing, and somehow I managed to um, uh, have a private meeting with Ramdas. He must have been doing that for people, although there were you know probably seven or eight hundred people in this class. Um, so I remember I went to his apartment, which were in these townhouse buildings in Boulder, up on the hill, yeah. overlooking the university. And uh, uh, he was, I came in and he was sitting, you know, on a zafu, on a cushion on the floor. And I took my seat opposite him and uh, was ready to try to talk to him about my inner feeling of emptiness and my sexual insecurities and so on. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we were just sitting face to face, only he wasn't saying anything. So he was just sitting and staring at me. So I sat and stared at him. And um, I didn't know this was a thing he did. You know, I, for me, it was just like, like, who is, you know, what's happening here? Um, so we <laughs> sat in and stared at each other for the longest period of time. But it probably was five minutes at least. But for me, it seemed like a whole therapeutic hour. And uh, finally, uh, uh, Ramda said something like, uh, "Are you in? Are you in there? Uh, I'm in here, far out." Mm. <laughs> and uh, uh, all of my, you know, all the stuff I would have talked to him about, wanted to talk to him about, had come up. All my insecurities and so on, it had come up, washed through me. And but I had been able to maintain the uh, connection with him. So. After that, I think I must have poured my heart out, but we had established a, uh, a, a connection that, that um, uh, I think briefly, momentarily, for those few minutes, had me uh, uh, slightly disidentifying with, uh, with all the uh, anxieties that I was totally identified with at that time. So it was the beginning of a loosening. Uh, that uh, I always look to him for, mm. learn from him about, mm. that I've used as a therapist. You know, now I tend to stare too much at my patients. <laughs> um, <laughs> later, much later, maybe ten years later, fifteen years later, I had a therapist, a wonderful therapist in New York, who I would go to see, and uh, I tended to do the staring thing with him instead of talking. I would just like you know hold the gaze, and he had no patience for that. He was like. You know, after a few, uh, you know, 30 seconds of that, he would go, blink, Mark, blink. Because <laughs> he was on to how I was kind of insecurely attaching uh, to, you know, I wanted the connection so much that I was uncomfortable being in my own, in the way we were talking before, in my own identity, in my own personality. So I had to learn later on. Uh, after first becoming nobody, I had to learn how to hold that sense of somebody in order mm. to be, uh, you know, a, a useful person in the world. Mm. It's uh, it's an interesting dance. The, the, yeah, that it is. Very much. Yeah. yeah. So in India, we uh, ended up, and we were with Maharaji, and we ended up in an ashram way up in the Himalayas, we were supposed to do a meditation course with uh, Munindra. I think you know, really? you know Munindra is a uh, mm-hmm. Buddhist teacher, Vipassana teacher. Uh, so he couldn't come, and we ended up doing it on our own, and it was pretty amazing. And then somehow Maharaji just kept sending more people up. So we had a whole ashram full of people, the last thing in the world that Ramdas wanted. And he, uh, it, he did that thing. What he uh-huh. used to do, he'd see somebody, and they'd sit right in front of each other yeah. and lock eyes. And then he would say, is there anything in the world that you're afraid to say? If there is anything in the world that you're afraid to say, say it now. Uh, uh And then (laughs) Uh people would blurt out all the stuff. Now, what happened is, because it's India, the people next door 
and the people above, they could hear <laughs> everything. <all> <laughs> and everybody had the same shit. It was all around sexual blah, yeah. blah, you know, from uh, generally speaking and very specifically speaking. And we all yeah. knew that after, oh, wow, you. <laughs> so it yeah. all just came out and got like a big laundry mat. It all got clear. Yeah. You know, I'm remembering as we're talking the the later part of that conversation with with Ramdas when at Naropa when I think I did start to talk to him about my own insecurities, and I and I remember him telling me like, try to relax a little more and trust your own heart. I think that was really I don't know I don't know if I wrote that in the book or mm, not, no, but I um, so. but I should have uh, <laughs> because uh, although I haven't remembered that in a long time, it made a big impression on me. Mm. Um, and it was the right advice. Yeah, I think it's the right advice for all of us. Actually. Yeah, actually, it, it's also um, you t- talk about something else, which is really anathema to people, which is the mystery, which is the unknowing, and we don't we need to know what the shit is going on here, or else you know, in ourselves, outside of ourselves, and so on. Um, and and the Tibetan tradition. The moments of unknowing when the mind is naturally loosed from its moorings are special opportunities. Uh, that's something we don't talk about a lot because it's it's loss of control, it's surrender, it's it's got a bunch of stuff that is not very uh, appealing to Westerners. Talk about that, yeah, the unknowing, which is yeah. Well, I, I structured that book, that uh, going to pieces without falling apart. I structured it around the. Um, the four stages of uh, Tibetan highest yoga tantra mm. that I only that I only knew about it because I had been in uh, in Dharamsala when I was in medical school. I went to Dharamsala with uh, a uh, a Harvard cardiologist who was doing research on uh, Tibetan monks doing heat yoga, tumo yoga, it was called, where they would sit outside wearing very little clothes in the cold weather and. Uh, through the power of their own meditation, raise their inner body temperatures. And we, we went to measure, you know, with our uh, Western uh, uh, rectal probes, we, we, we went to measure the monks' temperatures. And we brought along Jeffrey Hopkins, mm. who's a professor of Tibetan studies at Virginia then, as our translator. And uh, after we made our measurements and so on, I hung around with uh, Jeffrey and a couple of the other Western monks, and they started talking about... Uh, uh, highest yoga tantra, which I knew nothing about, but the the uh, the four stages of tantra are compared to the four stages of falling in love, hmm. uh, um, looking, smiling, embracing, and orgasm. Uh, looking being the eye contact that we were just talking about, because it's in those in the falling in love that culminates in the in you know intercourse and orgasm. The self is loosed from its moorings and loses. You know, one becomes lost in. Uh, what Bob calls the orgasmic bliss, you know, which is as close as we can get to the bliss of nirvana. Uh, maybe it's the same. If samsara and nirvana are the same, it, it may be the same uh, in uh, in worldly life. Uh, so um, that was that. You know, when I understood that as the way to structure the book, the book came uh, very easily. Mm. That's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm aware of that. That. Uh, that analogy too, um, but as you speak it, I remember my own. You know, Ramdas seems to be our focus here. I <laughs> because I don't know why. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, um, when I first met him, yeah, uh, I, and this is when was that? So that was at the end of the sixties, sixty nine, seventy. Yeah. I really, was, yeah, I was a program director for a radio, uh, rock and roll radio station in Montreal. Huh. And this is a story I've told about three billion times on, on podcasts, but briefly. Uh, I've never heard it. Yeah. And they, uh, I got a call saying, okay, there's uh, uh, Ramdas is giving a lecture at McGill University. We'd like you to help promote it. And I, they put it, the person through to me, and I said, Ramdas? Mm-hmm. Don't know that. What that? And, oh, Richard Alpert, Tim Leary, you know, oh, love them. Okay, it all clicked for me, and I told them, to send me a, a previous uh, talk, and they did. And, of course, every word was like, oh, God, yeah. I'd been waiting all 22 years or whatever it was mm-hmm. to hear that. And But I have to meet him. So they gave, they let, you know, they gave me the address. They let me go. And he was alone in a duplex in Montreal, which is where mm-hmm. I'm from, and uh, opened the door. 
and what you described just now in that story without there was no purpose i had no you had a purpose you were in, in going to see him there was no purpose but the exact same thing ended up which mm. was total just complete uh, contact and i felt as if shit this is the first person who's give a shit about not thinking about whatever else people think about and attention being completely diverted and what happened was i had total trust in that moment mm. which is you know you to set ourselves adrift requires a trust that for most of us was lost in childhood that perfectly mm. encapsulates exactly what i was thinking in that or what happened to me in that moment Mm-hmm. And it was profound that I had not, I, I, it was like a breath of fresh air. You know, it was really a, a powerful thing. And it's funny because, I mean, at this last retreat we had in, in December, uh, a, 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 a new friend, I don't know him that well, he's an acquaintance, but he's been at Apple for many years, a senior executive over there, Uh he came because somebody just said, yeah, Ram Das, he got turned on, he came. He had no idea about anything, Mark, nothing. <laughs> yeah. He went into the dining room where, you know, where we all gather together and eat, and he went towards the back, and then suddenly he sees Ram Das in his wheelchair, and for some reason, Ram Das turns around and encounters him from about 10, 15 feet. Same thing. He, he was, it was like a laser, and he couldn't, you know, no matter he was going through all kinds of, oh, 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 you know, Ram Dass, whatever, all that kind of stuff that we go through. He just let go in the moment mm-hmm. and had, yeah. a, and had a, a very deep, profound, even mystical experience. And Ram Dass didn't never met him, didn't know him from Adam, yeah. nothing, whatever this was supposed to, you know, it's just one of those things that happens. But that... Uh, that created a trust in him. I, I just saw him again at Wisdom 2.0, where I was last weekend. Yeah. And uh, he told me the story, which I, hadn't, I didn't know. And the trust that was engendered with this, it's incredible. And how much that means to us, eh? trust. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't know any of the, um, the psychotherapeutic uh, um, takes on all of this when, back when I was first, you know, meeting Ramdas and Joseph and Jack and doing Vipassana meditation and so on. But then when I, when I became a psychiatrist and started reading in the psychoanalytic literature, I, I started reading um, this guy, ch- British child analyst, Donald Winnicott, D.W. Winnicott. Mm. I, I quote from him a lot in that book yeah, yeah. because he talks about the infant parent prototype of that kind of trust. Um, He says that the opposite of disintegration, the opposite of integration, meaning having a real self, isn't disintegration, you know, where you become crazy or psychotic or whatever, but it's unintegration, Hmm. where you can just lay back and let go. And uh, he says that uh, infants, little kids up, you know, the first couple of years of life, really depend on the non-interfering, non-abandoning presence of the parents or caregivers to provide like an umbrella over them so that they can lay back, Mm. relax, play, imagine, trust, you know, and that without that, without enough of that, the, the ego, the self has to mobilize itself prematurely and create what he called a false self that's like a caretaker self that you know creates a front for the world um, at the expense of you know creative uh, uh, engagement with one's own potential. Um, so I found that you know as a therapist in training and as someone who'd been in personal therapy and as a psychiatrist treating patients. Uh, that that was the perfect correlate for what I had already learned from the uh, spiritual explorations, you know, and that so many people come to Ramdas or to meditation or to me as a therapist because they're carrying that uh, caretaker self, that false self, you know, uh, that's preventing them from 
trusting or relaxing the way you, this Apple executive was able to do instantaneously with Ramdas, you know, because Ramdas is just exuding that even now, you know, he really has found that in himself, that capacity to uh, facilitate it in other people, you know, more so now. More so I think, now. yeah, no, that's what I, that's he's he's really he's really embodied it. Yeah. Yeah. So what this uh, doctor and uh, your uh, it's it is all through the book i was very fast yeah. I, I, I get, I, he's not with us now he's not with us anymore no no, right. no. but okay. he was with us into the 70s early uh-huh. right he he came to new york he came to he was invited by the new york psychoanalytic the most prestigious psychoanalytic institute in new york and he gave his penultimate paper which, which is the the, the most beautiful wisdom filled paper that nobody understood. And they, <laughs> they uh, bickered with him, they attacked him and he went back to his hotel room and had a heart attack um, and died a couple of months later. Yeah. Really? Uh, oh. Yeah. 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 But sacrificed himself on the altar of uh, <laughs> the New York psychoanalytic. Oh, yeah. But the paper lives on. Right. But uh, I suppose or to me, the, his premise seems absolutely 100 billion percent and i mean and this project that i've been working on with uh, duncan trussell actually uh oh. is uh, about th- you know the attachment we have to our story and in this case you could easily just say to that transient uh, overlay that we to protect ourselves yeah. to defend yeah. ourselves that's the important thing to understand that it, that it's a um it's a creative construction. Even the story, even the false self, is a creative construction that comes from, uh, you know, from deep within. So even while you're uh, uh, learning to disidentify with the narrative and so on, it's important to respect and to honor mm. the energy that went into the creation of it. Mm. You know, because yeah. so much of the self is bound up in that. Yeah. yeah. Not 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 just the illusory self, but the creative self that's trying to find its way home you know yeah yeah boy you know and we do so much self-bashing this just is probably the epitome of it what do we do then what are the steps you would suggest people would take to dissemble to devolve that belief shall we say well the steps it's always dangerous to create you know the the hierarchy of steps and so on but that's why I like the looking, smiling, embracing, and orgasm kind of formulation. Because um, uh, the most important thing that I've found is uh, what we do in meditation, and and also I think when a when a uh, a therapy relationship is good, we're doing something similar, is to create a kind of holding environment, in the, which is a word that comes out of Winnicott uh, also, a, a holding environment analogous to what a parent does with a baby. Uh, where we learn to hold not just physically, but emotionally, um, even mentally, we learn to hold and experience lightly so that uh, our defenses, our anxieties, uh, our insecurities, and so on, uh, we're not trying to get rid of them. uh, We're not trying to leapfrog over them. But in holding them lightly, we're learning to loosen the grip that they have over us. And the space that's created, we can flow into that space that we create. And um, the the tenor, the the um, uh, the feeling of that space is a loving one. So uh, uh, the more we uh, flow into that space, the more we actually are filled with what we think of as love. And the practicality of that, the practicality mm-hmm. of getting lighter. Mm-hmm. What is the suggestion there? I mean, we've talked about meditation, and I guess that's something we really need to talk about a little bit more because that is that is probably a... It's uh, one way. I think it's one, not for everybody, but but uh, for those who are so inclined, I think it's a, it's a direct way uh, or an, an, an indirect way. <laughs> you know, it's an attempt. Uh, but I would include, I mean, to me, and you know how much we are a real blend you know, certainly we come from the tradition of guru yoga. And certainly uh, the central thing is, is devotion, bhakti, 
And yet we were put by Neem Karoli Baba into the hands of Buddhism. Did you ever hear that story Krishnas tells? He and I were with Maharaji because he had a bad leg and I brought him over there and he was Maharaji, then walked around and he was better. You know, one of those miracle stories. But in the middle of it, Krishnas had a book, his diary. He kept a nice diary and put pictures in and everything. Maharaji said, let me see that. And he opened it up uh, and he had put, I think, part of the Mahamudra in there. And Maharaji Uh asked for that to be translated. He went, Tik, yep, Mm -hmm. that is Uh right on. Uh-huh. And then there was a next page, there's a big picture of him. He said, who's that? And we were like, yeah, funny. It's you. Yeah. Nay, Buddha. Huh? So, which always was this fascinating thing to me because we were all steeped, this is another thing everybody knows, in Vipassana mm-hmm. by going to those courses. And Ram Dass mm-hmm. met... Uh, uh, I met Joseph at the course, and Ramdas met uh, Sharon, and so on and so forth. So uh, that has always been. It's it, we are a unique blend, I think that yeah. way. Yeah, you know, I know. What, I think that's been wonderful. Yeah. And, well, you know how Ramdas is always talking these days about uh, I am loving awareness. Yeah. You know, so he's trying to bring like the the current of love and the current of wisdom. Uh, into one thing. Um, I've been thinking, I don't know how right any of this is, but I've been thinking that even uh, thinking of those two things, love and awareness as separate, might be wrong. That that maybe love and awareness, the way heart-mind is one word, you know, in Japanese or whatever, that that love and awareness might actually be the same thing. Um, so that, uh, you know, ultimately those two streams go back to one place. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he, well, there was a funny moment, actually, with Krishnas and me and Ram Dass one day at, at, at the Maui retreat talking about, Ram Dass was talking about, I am loving awareness. Yeah, yeah. Krishnas goes, you know, Ram Dass, this is right in front of, you know, 400 people. Mm-hmm. I don't really get that, you know. Mm-hmm. All I know is Ram Ram. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, now you're going to bring this up after 10 years of him going, mm-hmm. I'm loving a word? And then Ram Das went, well, how about Ram Ram loving awareness? <laughs> it's beyond the I am, it is mm-hmm. the it. Mm-hmm. And so he's been doing that lately. And oh, a really right. funny thing happened. We have... Uh, this is a bit of a commercial, Mark. We have a record yes. that's out now that's uh, uh, a, um, a wonderful uh, get-together between a young man named, uh, his, his band name is East Forest, and he went and interviewed Ram Dass, And at one point, you know, he's just, Ram Dass is talking about loving awareness, right? So he put music to it. It's a whole album with like 12 or 14 songs of Ram Dass, like Dark Thoughts, Loving Aware, you know, all of Ram Dass's yeah. different themes. It's really fantastic because it's easy to, to absorb. Mm. And then they got Krishna Das to sing on it. And he ended up at what, this is to me, I mean, maybe it's too arcane, but to me it was phenomenal because you have Ram Dass going, Loving awareness, I am loving awareness, and Krishna is going Ram, 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 and they got yeah. the whole thing as one egg. And what I was thinking of before around meditation that what, for instance, Krishna does, does chanting is nothing more or less than meditation to me. If it's if you are doing it, yes, it's it's a it can be an orgasmic experience, yeah. and many people have that, right? So I think of meditation in that sense very broadly. Yeah, I think so too. And also when he's singing, it's also a kind of service. So I, th- I think that's the other, the, you know, the, the karma yoga aspect of uh, uh, making yourself into a vehicle where you're useful in the world, useful for other people, you know, where other people's welfare becomes more important or as important, equally important to your own, or where your own welfare is actually predicated on being useful to other people, that the the satisfaction and fulfillment and uh, even joy that comes from uh, being a vehicle in that way is, uh, you know, that's a kind of meditation also. Yeah. And isn't it 
true that when that happens, when somebody engages in any way, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a big way, Christian art singing thousands of people and all right. that, can be just you with a few friends in a room meditating together and offering that. Yeah. And once you do that, we all find you stop thinking about yourself. Yeah. No, it can be you in a room making dinner for uh, your family. Yeah. You, you know, Anything. I mean, it's yeah. down. It's down to that level, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, um, the most important level. Yeah. No, absolutely. I love. Here's something uh, to quote you from the book. Um, Meditation involves a kind of co-opting of the obsessive mind, replacing it with an ever more subtle version of itself that eventually must be surrendered completely, releasing the meditator into the terror and delight of pure expression. Mm. Terror and delight of pure expression. Okay, come on, tell me about that. Well, terror and delight, that, that comes from the Vasudhi Magga, mm. which is the, fi the fifth century uh, Sri Lankan uh, um, description of the, the path to purification. So it was like a, one of the first meditation manuals that was written down. And in the Vipassana tradition, where they outline the so-called progress to insight, they have all the stages that the meditator goes through, and the... Um, uh, the, some of the last stages before the equanimity of enlightenment dawns uh, are what they call the stages of terror and delight. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, all, I really like that because it's not that you progress into ever more sublime states, you know, until finally you lift off. Yeah. That <laughs> even, yeah. even at the very, you know, it's, if you believe in this kind of hierarchy or progression, which I'm suspicious of, but it's nice to have it all laid out as a map. Uh, but e you know, even towards the end of that, the experiences of terror are just as strong as the experiences of delight. And they talk about, um, I don't know if I quoted in there, they talk about the feelings of a, uh, a, um, a timid man who just wants to live in peace, uh, mm -hmm. experiencing the world as like, a herd of wild elephants coming at him and trampling him uh, as the, uh, uh, the uh, impermanence of sesame seeds being roasted. There's a, uh, there's a whole list, mm -hmm. wild hyenas, you know, you could just imagine in the jungles of fifth century uh, Ceylon, you know, uh, the most, the scariest things you could possibly, yeah. that's what it's like to uh, let go of, uh, of yourself, you know, of all the things you're clinging to, to keep you safe in the world mm. uh, that needs to happen. Yeah. So that's where the, I love that phrase of uh, terror. Yeah. Light. I loved it too. <laughs> Embracing the hundred thousand beautiful visions and the hundred thousand horrible visions. Yeah. And uh, to me, and, and this is probably, you know, one of the prime or a primal Buddhist, um, concept which is basically the reality of our lives impermanence and that's so very difficult for all of us to grasp getting more and more difficult getting more and more difficult <laughs> we're yeah. living it now yeah right yeah right yeah how do we warm up a little bit to uh, transience you talked about you know how the Buddha. Talks well, that's about the I think that's the beauty. That's the gift of practicing from when you're young. Oh, because um, a lot of people come. You know, a lot of people are coming to spirituality, to meditation, and so on uh, as they're aging. You know, when they get sick, when you know, when it's finally in their face that they're going to die, or that their loved ones are going to die. And uh, a lot of the spiritual life, a lot of the meditation experience is really about experiencing that on a micro level, you know, moment to moment to moment, things really are changing. You know, you think you've established yourself uh, in one way and then the rug is pulled out from under you. And if you're paying attention all through life, I think maybe, we'll see, maybe it gets, uh, uh, you know, maybe you're a little more practiced. Mm. Um, but it's, I think it's the, the, re, the underlying reality is there everywhere. So even when you're young and healthy, if you were lucky enough to be secure, if things are stable, if you have a job and a family and a place to live and everything, even within that, you, you will be able to experience how unstable everything is. 
uh, you know, if you're not if you're not pushing it away. So, uh, and by turning your mind towards that, that that's what the when the Buddha gave his first teachings of the four noble truths. You know, his first truth is dukkha, uh, which means if you take the word apart, dukkha means hard to face. Uh, sukha really? means yeah. pleasant yeah. to face or sweet, but dukkha ka is face. So dukkha is difficult to face. So there's something, Buddha said everywhere, there's something even in happiness that's difficult to face. You know, mm. he didn't deny happiness, but he, but he said even, you know, there's plenty of happiness, but there's a quality that's difficult to face everywhere. What is that? It's this quality of change. Mm. You know, we don't want to see it and we turn away. Mm. Uh, and because it's a little bit traumatic. Even a you know very small trauma, but it's a little bit traumatic. And the tendency of the ego is to you know no, I don't want to see that. So we're we're always turning a little bit, turning back towards that, in order to learn how to hold it uh, uh, without freaking out. Yeah, and you do talk about surrender in the book, and I I certainly feel, and when we talk about our tradition, which really blends bhakti and and. Uh, foundational Buddhist concepts, uh, certainly it's, it's like wildly important to, uh, to bring into, and, and I mean, you say meditation isn't for everybody and that's true. And that's why I sort of expanded it just to any kind of practice that allows you to just be with yourself in some self inquiry process and that this uh the 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 trust that we're talking about the heart opening stuff around bhakti uh that's why i feel you know uh, that uh, we've been given this chant thing that we do that krishna exemplifies out there uh and that allows a little bit of spaciousness to happen in that heart opening process where you can have a little bit more trust, you you can look into somebody and not and you know be okay and, and not go through eighteen zillion conniptions about who you think you are or you aren't relative to another person and how somebody like in our, in our cases that we we talked about Ramdas and and that presence developing that presence is possible, right? It yes. Is. Well, and I, I even think it's not just about self-inquiry or meditation or learning to be with oneself. It's also It also comes up, this need to surrender. Uh, it comes up in being with another person. It comes up in any kind of intimacy demands a certain kind of surrender. So that even for people who don't meditate, but we're, we are all relational beings. None of us exist, you know, completely isolated, independent, apart. Uh, no matter how lonely we feel. Um, so any kind of relationship demands a giving up of the, of some aspect of self. So there's always opportunity to practice. Mm. Always, always, mm. always. Mm. By the way, and this is a silly question to a psychotherapist, but I, uh, you do say that psycho, uh, psychotherapy helps somebody break through a layer of defensiveness that monastic training had not touched that this uh, when i read this i was like yeah and many of us who co who have been doing this for decades and doing practice and have all this quote unquote spiritual experience um many a times poo poo again it's not respect this is a theme of this uh, our chat really is not respecting that personality not respecting and embracing everything yeah, that personality and also how much that personality needs communion with others. Uh, you know, even in a, in a community like, like yours, like ours, where the uh, community bonds over 50 years, you know, has been so important. The, uh, uh, but the, um, we still tend to look at it as an individual journey rather than as... Uh, uh, when I was with Ramdas last year, he was talking about... Uh, you know, how we exist as pods of souls, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I thought was so beautiful. I hadn't heard him say that before. He's probably been saying it for a while. But uh, that idea of, uh, of uh, pods of us, you know, for, uh, uh, who are connected by cords of love, you know, mm. uh, uh, over lifetimes is a, uh, uh, such a beautiful thing. Yeah. But uh, it leaves us of that, you know, aching loneliness, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 
I do, but back to the therapy thing, psychotherapy, yeah. and um, I do think people, you know, they they uh, it's short shrift for them to deal with psychological issues, issues that come from deep, 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 you know, uh, that create the habitual tendencies and neurotic tendencies. And so uh, I'm sure in your practice you are working with people who who come from this background or have spent, you know, a good amount of time working on themselves, self-inquiry as we talked about, but uh, have just started working with you and people like you around uh, these psychological issues that we tend to just push away. Yeah, well, I feel very lucky about that because the people who are engaged in a spiritual path for whatever reason trust me with their personal um, uh, uh, issues also. Uh, um, and being able to work on both the psychological level, the emotional level, and the spiritual level at, one, at once, it feels like such a, uh, a wonderful opportunity and such a privilege. Mm. That's great. Because the spiritual thing, I think, gives people some, that, that holding capacity that we were talking about before. You, you know, they're less um, uh, self-conscious. There's less shame around the, some of the personal stuff. They may not have really dealt with it. You know, they may be waiting for a therapist to help them, but they're willing, you know, the way a, a good poet uh, might be, they're willing to take their personal stuff and, and uh, make an offering out of it. Mm. Yeah, I find in myself, I'm uh, it, I'm way less reactive than I used to be about anything uh, that comes up in, in negatively for me, and so that uh, I could be more open. I, I worked with a... You could be a good candidate, Roger. Yeah, I am. I'm calling you after we <laughs> get off here, okay? <laughs> yes. I'm not kidding. Uh, okay. I worked with... Uh, <laughs> A Jungian, uh, actually, Christian and, and I had this wonderful Siegelman, I think his name was, many years ago in the cool. 90s in, in L.A. when we were out there. And he was so fantastic. He, would, he, would, he wasn't like into gurus and stuff. He was a real, you know, devout Jungian. And he, I'd come in and he'd go, let's talk to Maharaji. Why don't we sit yeah. here in silence for a while and see what he has to say? I was like... Who does that? You know, it was so wide open. And when I first went to India, because the other th one other thing in this book uh, that you talk about is the uh, sand play, Jung's, that was developed by a Swiss uh, psych psychiatrist, I guess. Yeah, psychotherapist. One, yeah, yeah. One of her disciples was in a Sri Aurobindo ashram in Oroville, which I, huh. that's one of the first places I went to in India because I couldn't find Maharaji right away. They were, I didn't go to the first meditation retreat. I was in Oroville, and this guy introduced me to the sandbox, huh. okay? And I hadn't thought of this forever, and I read this, and I'm going, holy shit. So he had me play in the sandbox. I had a wonderful time, and I had a cross that was in the middle, and then I had an equidistant from there. There was other symbols of, you know, I just, it was just wonderful. Guy looked at it and he went, "Yeah, so messianic uh, thing you got going here, huh? Eh? <laughs> Westerners gonna come save us all and still get laid. It's kind of a thing, you know." Here you are now doing your podcast. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, Stephen Batchelor, you know, after being a Tibetan monk and so on uh, for many years, ended up in uh, Switzerland with, uh, uh, I think, with Dora Kalp, who founded Sand Play Therapy, and he. He got a whole second wind out of the uh, sand play thing mm. um, that informed, you know, gave him another way of understanding what he had already been learning from the uh, from the Tibetans. And I was in Houston a couple of years ago, and uh, in downtown Houston, near the art museum, the Jung Center, uh, it has a fantastic property that was gifted to them in the 30s or something by early disciples of Jung. And in the back room of the Young Center in Houston, they have all that sand play oh. stuff, like all on shelves. Every it's not used so much anymore, at least in Texas. Uh, but they have they have all the material that you were probably playing with in Oroville. Mm, that's that's, that's great. Unbelievable. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, of course, you put this at the end of the book, which is around passion and. Uh, 
there, there is uh, people out there get this book. Uh, it's this is something we don't like to it's talk about. Print. Yeah, it's uh-huh. it's still in print. Yeah, it's no, still it's in print. some time yeah. back. Uh, sexual relations serve both as a vivid model for the spiritual journey and as a reminder of how much is lost when the spiritual dimension of sexuality is neglected. I, I mean, this is Im- certainly important, especially for us Westerners that are so screwed up around this. Uh, you know, I love that. And you talk about the truth that clinging is as much of a problem in lovemaking as in the rest of life. Yeah, t- it's just... A little, give us a little glimpse of of uh, how we can maybe approach this in a way that is way more healthy than we do. Well, I think with um, you know sexual the, with the sexual liberation of the '60s and so on that we're that we're still trying to figure out, where um, uh, uh, everyone was equating uh, uh, number of number and type of sexual experience as uh, the the barometer of uh, sexual health or sexual gratification that the uh, uh, the depth or um, intensity or uh, you know what I'm calling here the spiritual dimension of lovemaking that that has tended to get lost um, so you, you know, it's been there since the time of the Kama Sutra and whatnot yeah. from before that, you, you know, and we all kind of know it, but uh, to actually uh, be fortunate enough to experience it with uh, someone who you love, uh, you know, it's a, um, uh, uh, it's a direct route to something, you know, to something uh, mysterious and indescribable and um, life-affirming. Uh, and replenishing, mm. so and not to be not to be neglected. Yeah, and the clinging part it just it calls to mind. It's there's beautiful teachings if you can have the spaciousness to allow them uh, to be seen, and especially if you have that kind of intimacy with somebody else and trust. Yeah, well, I wrote a book. I wrote a book after this one called "Open to Desire." where I, I tried to rescue desire from, uh, you know, desire is the source of suffering and should be put down. And I actually used the Ramayana. Uh, oh. as, yeah, I used bits of the Ramayana to introduce each chapter because of uh, the love of uh, Sita and Ram and then the love of Hanuman for uh, Sita and Ram, uh, that, you know, that desire has the capacity to transcend itself and uh, show you uh, show you where your own clinging is mm. um, so uh, and I was inspired in that book by a um, a book by Anne Carson, the poet Anne Carson, who was also a Greek uh, classical Greek scholar and an expert on Sappho and uh, uh, who was a lesbian poet from you know Greek times and she has a book called Eros the Bittersweet where uh, where she says uh, bittersweet is actually a mistranslation that the better translation is is sweet bitter uh that desire first gives you a uh, you know the sense of uh, uh the first taste of sweetness but because it can't last in the way we want it to there's always an aftermath of bitterness which gets into the kind of emptiness we were talking about at the beginning mm. so there's a window there even in the aftermath there's a window to our own clinging where we're trying to hold on to the initial sweetness, but because of impermanence, that isn't possible. So to be able to embrace the whole, the sweet bitter, the bittersweet of Eros, rather than uh, you know either giving ourselves over to it uh, uh, without thinking, um, or uh, trying to get rid of it altogether. You know, there's this middle path uh, that that allows desire to do what it's good for. What's the name of the book? Open to Desire. When did you write that? I wrote it in, uh, I wrote it around 2001, just when 9-11 happened. Oh, okay. So it, it wasn't a good time for it. <laughs> oh, but, uh, <laughs> and who, what's the name of the uh, person who wrote Eros, uh, the Bittersweet? Eros, the Bittersweet, Anne Carson. Anne Carson. A-N-N-E. And Carson. by the way, everybody, this will all be available and links to Mark's books uh, on the show notes page, beherenownetwork.com slash mindrolling. And, uh, yeah, so you don't have to worry. I just wrote it down because I am so interested. I want to get it now. I don't want to wait for the show notes. Uh, and by the, the, the last thing I'll, uh, I loved, uh, 
in this book is we are trained to keep ourselves together, but we don't get much teaching in falling apart, which therein lies going to pieces without falling apart. And uh, wonderful book. Then uh, thank God, Ramdas. I mean, I said, <laughs> thanks, Raghur. Yeah, really. <laughs> he, he turned me on like he's always turned me on. So happy to have you here and share. It's, it's wonderful, Mark. Thank you so Great much. Great to talk to you, too. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Roger. Everybody, we'll see you next week on Mind Rolling on Be Here Now Network.